Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delhi United Methodist Church. Thank you for being with us here today. A few announcements. The Ad Council will meet Tuesday night at 6. Masks will be required. And please watch your email regarding Christmas Eve. Now, let us prepare our hearts for worship. Father, we thank you for the many blessings you give us. Thank you for granting us the gift of life and our health. Although we cannot gather together physically, we are united by our common faith and love for you in our hearts. We all exalt you today. We worship and praise you with joy. Our purpose in life is only to worship you. Keep us in good health so we may continue to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We will now be singing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God, the Father of us all, send your spirit to meet us in our fear, anxiety, and loneliness. Fill us with wonder and love as we too wait for this baby to be born. May the spirit be with us like he was with Elizabeth and Mary, and our hearts leap for joy as Elizabeth's baby, John, leaped for joy in her womb. Because we know the rest of the story, we recognize the miracle of what Jesus did for us on that cross. Such love is beyond our understanding, but we do know this is the God, the Son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit we need in our lives today. Praise be to God. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
We want everything to look nice. The decorations of the season, our homes with their lights and tinsel, wreaths and ribbons. We want to lighten the darkness around us, bring beauty to the ugliness that wears us down. We decorate because it is tradition, because it lifts our hearts, because it makes us feel like children again. We deck our halls because company is coming. The prophet Isaiah smiled when he said, God will give us a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. No matter how far we feel from the spirit of the season, God promises to decorate us with love and with joy. We light these candles as a sign of our joy in the beautiful things of this season, not just the things that glitter and flash, but the deeper things, the beauty of the heart and the soul, the beauty of love shared in service and in hospitality. We light this candle of joy because company is coming. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Today's Psalter reading comes from Psalm 114, verses 1 through 8. When Israel came out of Egypt, Jacob from a people of foreign tongue. Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel, his dominion. The sea looked and fled, the Jordan turned back. The mountains leaped like rams, the hills like lambs. Why was it, sea, that you fled? Why, Jordan, did you turn back? Why, mountains, did you leap like rams, you hills like lambs? Tremble, earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool, the hard rock into springs of water. The gospel lesson comes from Luke 1, verses 39 through 56. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in, my, in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has set the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Let us pray. Loving God, in these challenging times, may we experience your presence in a much more tangible way. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer, in whose name we pray. Amen. By now, we all know what it feels like to be alone, to be isolated. For nine months, we have been asked not to have physical contact with others outside our immediate families, to wear a mask, to stand six feet from others, to order out rather than eat in, to not travel, not gather, not get married, limit attendance at funerals, close our business doors, 
and at times quarantined for 10 or 14 days. It was approximately 12 years ago when I met Lisa. Lisa was a 16-year-old teen teenager who was hurting and lonely. Lisa had lived a life that was full of challenges. Lisa's father was a drug addict who abused her and ultimately abandoned her. Lisa was taken in by her uncle, who had already had three children of his own, and did his best to raise his niece. When I met Lisa, she was struggling with low self-esteem, depression, and cutting. Self-harm had become her release and the one thing that she could control in her life. One day she asked if we could talk sometime. We scheduled an appointment. We found a quiet place in the corner of a coffee shop. And Lisa began to share her struggles with me. She told me about the abuse and the abandonment, talked about how she couldn't understand how a father wouldn't want to have or see his child. She shared how her mom was an addict and couldn't understand why her mom took off and left her alone. As she continued to share the emotion that began to pour out of her as she began to weep at the pain she had suffered and was continuing to suffer. Her last statement, though, is what hit me the hardest. I feel so totally alone. This Advent, we are exploring the period of time with the hope of rethinking how we understand and how we view Christmas and the Advent season. The goal is to break away from the materialistic, the marketing, and the self-centered approach that Advent has taken in our country and in many of our homes and replace it with something more tangible and meaningful. Mary had just experienced a divine interaction with the Archangel Gabriel in chapter 1 of Luke. She had been told that she would conceive as a virgin, a child, by the work of the Holy Spirit. She was also told that to prove this, that, that the, her uh, relative, who was significantly older, uh, would be having a baby and was already six months along. Mary, in an act of faith, looked at the angel and said, I am the Lord's servant. May your work to me be fulfilled. I can't imagine what was going through her head at the moment that the angel left as all this emotion came running in. And she began to think about the ramifications of this news, the impact for her and her fiance. Full of fear, excitement, and maybe a hint of doubt, Mary quickly gathers her things and takes a three to five day trip along a very treacherous road to her relative Elizabeth's home in Judea. The road she traveled was one riddled with bandits and was known for crime and assaults. More than likely, she would have gone with a caravan leaving her village to go to Judea. And it would be safer that way because it doesn't tell us that Joseph went with her and more than likely he did not. Either way, Mary took significant risk making that journey. But by the time that she arrived at Elizabeth's house, the excitement had clearly not worn off. Because it says as she entered the home of the priest Zechariah, she shared a greeting. We all remember who Zechariah is, don't we? Earlier on in the chapter, the same angel that appeared to Mary had previously appeared to Zechariah, who was a priest, and his wife Elizabeth was also part of the Levite family. People of great faith and service. A pastor in the church. This same Zechariah was told by Gabriel, your wife, even at her old age, will have a child. Even though they had never been able to have kids. And, and clearly Zechariah is doubting and he questions the angel. And doubt overtook any faith that he had. And the consequence for him was he was made mute. The angel said, you will remain mute until the day your child is born. And it's his home 
that Mary arrives at. As Mary walks in and sees her relative Elizabeth standing there, she excitedly greets her with a warm greeting and tells her of what has taken place. When Elizabeth hears Mary's excitement in her greeting, John the Baptist, who's the baby in her womb, it says, leaped in her room, in her womb, and Elizabeth was immediately filled with the Holy Spirit. She's so impacted by this moment, by this experience, that she casts a blessing upon Mary, a double blessing, in a form of rhetoric common in the age. She, she gives a blessing to Mary, but in reality, it's a blessing for Jesus, her unborn child, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. She blesses Mary and, wor and worships Jesus all in the same breath. Before he is even born. I want you to think about this for a moment. Mary has just been told three days, three to five days earlier that she is going to have a child. Jesus is little more than probably an embryo at this point, but his presence is felt by Mary. Elizabeth and John. Elizabeth is humbled by that interaction, humbled by this moment where she experiences God's divine hand in her relative Mary and recognizes who it is that she's holding. In her excitement of not only finding out that indeed her relative Elizabeth was pregnant, as Gabriel told her, but by the humbled celebration of praise and blessing offered by Elizabeth, Mary spontaneously bursts out in song. And it's in this moment that Mary sings probably the most famous song ever written in all of history, the Magnificat. Spontaneous song of humbled faith and praise of God and God's divine act in her, in her life and in her body. Jesus was still in production. He was still being knit together in Mary's womb. Yet, all three of them experienced Jesus' presence in that time. They had a special intimate moment with the Son of God, something that no other group of people in history will be able to experience. So all the fear, any doubt, is now wiped away at the affirmation of the presence of the unborn Son of God. And it says that Mary stayed for another three months. That'd be right about the time that John the Baptist, the preparer of the way, would be born. As I sat with Lisa in that coffee shop, my heart broke at what she shared with me. She was hurt, lonely, and angry. She had scars all over her arms from cutting as she struggled with all the emotion inside of her. She was alone and desperately wanted that loneliness replaced, healed, and filled by a meaningful relationship. After she had finished sharing, I shared with her a little bit of my own story of loneliness and brokenness. I shared with her the story of my hurt and pain and told her that I understood what she was feeling. Though different experiences, our pains were similar to one another. The big difference was, mine happened 10 years earlier, and I had found healing. And she looked at me and asked me how. I began to share with her that beautiful passage out of Hebrews 13, where God says, I will never leave you, and I will never stab you in the back. 
words of God to God's people, reminding them that even when they felt completely alone and abandoned, they were not. God was always with them. God was always there to hear their joy and to hear their pain. I reminded Lisa of God's grace and mercy and love. I shared with her the hope that was in, G in Jesus Christ and that she could find healing in her life by just giving that pain over to him. I then gave her two assignments. I challenged her to write a letter to her father and a letter to her uncle. I challenged her to express her feelings and, and share how the decisions that were made impacted her life and the pain that it caused and the hurt and the sense of loneliness. And after she, I said to write that letter, I said, but then I want you to do something else. At the end of each one of those letters, I want you to write, I love you and I forgive you. She looked at me, she said, I can't forgive them. I said to her, not right now you can't, but eventually when you finally experience that presence of Christ and you realize that you are a child of God who is loved and valued, when you experience God's forgiveness and grace in your own self, then you will be ready to express it to others. So I said, write that letter, get them all set, get them folded and put it in an envelope. And then hide them somewhere where nobody can find them. And I will be praying for you that in the weeks and months and years ahead, that there will be a point in time where you're going to know it's the right time. And you're going to give those letters to your dad and to your uncle. I prayed with her encouraged her, and said, well, I can get together with you whenever you would like. And we left that coffee shop. A few months later, we were at youth group, and I, I, we were in the middle of it, and I had to run into my office for a moment, and I had 40 kids running around the church, and I walked into my office, and on the desk was a gift-wrapped package in an envelope on top of it. It wasn't my birthday, it wasn't another holiday, it was a day in the middle of a month. But I had other things to do, and so I went back to youth group, and then after youth was over and the kids all left, and it was just me there in the dark church by myself, I went back to my office, sat down at my desk, and unwrapped the package. I was going to grab it for this morning and forgot to in the busyness of things going on here, but what was in that package now hangs in my office all these years later. It was a handmade charcoal drawing of a cross. A simple cross in a frame. The same cross that sits out here every All Saints Sunday. The same cross that sits right across from my desk that I see every morning that I sit down. And in that note, she wrote that she had given the letters to her uncle and her dad that she had found forgiveness and had begun to experience in her life God's presence. She said that she mailed it to her dad, who she hadn't seen in 16 years, and didn't expect to hear back, but forgave him. She wrote that when she gave the letter to her uncle, he got up, went to his room, and closed the door where he went off by himself to be alone to read it. She said the next day when she got up, he gave her a hug, said, I'm sorry, and that he loved me. She thanked me and said that she saw Jesus in me that day in the coffee shop. And she was reminded of God's grace, love, and presence in her life. My friends, we are in a time of unprecedented loneliness and isolation. 
It, become, it can become easy to become frustrated by the disconnectedness and the separation. Many of us find ourselves a little extra sensitive, quicker to become angry at others, and short and impatient. God did not make us to be this way, but for this season, we are. But I encourage you today to look back at this beautiful story with Mary and Elizabeth and John. And in those few minutes that they had that interaction, Mary and Elizabeth and John experienced the presence of Jesus Christ unlike anyone ever had or ever will. Because Jesus wasn't even born yet. And yet his presence was felt. And their lives and their faith were dramatically affected by that moment. In this time of challenge, I ask you, where has Jesus shown himself by the Spirit in your life this week, this Advent season? Are you so distracted by the things going on around you that you've missed the divine moments of God's presence in your life? It is my prayer that in this time of distraction from what is ordinary, you may find the presence of the extraordinary in your life and that your life would be forever changed. This week, I experienced that presence as I got a call on Thursday that the pastor who was going to install our new monitors that you see and are experiencing today needed to change his plans from next week to Thursday. It was not good timing. He arrived Thursday afternoon, saw me, he said, you're not looking well, my friend. He said, step into my office. And I'm like, okay. And I walked down the aisle and he knelt at this kneeler rail right here in front of the pulpit. And he said, kneel in my office. And my brother prayed over me, prayed over all the things going on in my life, the stress and the strain, the anxiousness, and the tiredness. And he said, brother, I love you. You are not alone in this. And he prayed. And he prayed for me. My friends, we have an opportunity to be the presence of Christ in the lives of those around us. May you experience God's presence in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit in a special way this Advent season. Because God wants to greatly impact your life if we will only stop and look. Loving God, may we experience your presence in a way that we have never experienced it before. From wherever we're watching this service, in the distance and isolation, may we be reminded that you never leave us and you never stab us in the back. Give us your grace, mercy, peace, and love. Remind us of the hope that we have in your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I have a special song for you, mean song by Karen and Laura Siebert.
As we continue in our worship this morning, we want to lift up the prayers, concerns of the people. We want to give thanks to those who gave to uh, the tool drive this fall. And uh, we the tool trailer, we've uh, got it completely remodeled. I don't have pictures for you today, but I will have them soon. And the trailer is now at Colesburg United Methodist Church, where they are doing the tool drive and continuing it this month. Also, we want to say thank you to those who gave to the angel tree, which we do have a picture of. And there are the many of the gifts that... <coughs> Excuse me, we're given for Angel Tree this year and just thankful for the generosity and love of all of our church members who gave to that. And we will ask a special blessing upon those gifts and the children that they will touch. I want to pray for support and healing for Karen Wall, Patsy Rounds, Kim Evers, Don Whittem, Kay Woodhouse, Vicki Hove, teachers and students as they work through a challenging year and all of our health and essential workers during this pandemic. Also want to pray for grace and comfort and peace for the families of Margaret O'Connell, Bruce Billings, and Kevin and Melissa Neiman on the death of Melissa's nephew. Continue to pray for those in uniform who continue to serve both in deployment and for our veterans as they have returned home. And again, for all of our emergency workers and frontline personnel in the midst of this pandemic. We need to continue to do ministry and continue to do the work of the church. And so we also want to encourage you that you can still give in your offering each week. You can drop that off here at the church and put it in the box, or you can mail it to our post office box um, as well, as, so that we can continue to do the good ministry that happens here at Delhi United Methodist Church. Will you join me in prayer? Loving God, we gather here together in, in your name, and we know that you are present with us, that you are listening, that you care, and that you want to hear from us. Lord God, I pray first and foremost that each one of us would experience your presence in a fresh and new way that affirms our faith, solidifies our hope, and gives us joy that comes only from you. Lord, we pray for those who, uh, for these gifts that have been given for Angel Tree and for all the many children who will be receiving them. It is our prayer that not only will they enjoy their gifts, but that they will experience your presence in their lives, that they would know the love that you have for them because of the love and generosity of your people. And so we bless these gifts to be used to further your kingdom in the lives of the children who will receive them. Lord, we thank you and pray for all of those who serve and lead in our church, who put these services together, who work hard to provide worship in the midst of this pandemic. We pray a blessing upon each of them. For those who are sick or ill or are in recovery or rehab or physical uh, therapy, for those who are expecting a surgery or treatment this week, we pray for your healing hand of grace upon them. Surround them in your loving arms. Give wisdom and discernment to the doctors and nurses. Lord, we pray for our doctors and nurses. We pray for our administrations in our hospitals and leadership. Lord, that you would give them strength in this crazy time that we are in that you will protect them and watch over them as they watch over us. Lord, we pray for those who have lost loved ones this week. We pray for M. Billings and all of her family, the loss of Bruce, and for the Neiman family at the loss of Melissa's nephew. Pray for those families who have experienced loss this year and have not been able to truly celebrate their lives or be able to mourn the way they need to because of this pandemic for the family of Margaret O'Connell. Lord, in your mercy, give them peace and comfort. May they know that you are with them. 
Lord, we ask your blessing upon the offering that we give, the, the tithes, the gifts that we give from all that you give us. Use it to further your kingdom and your mission in this world. We thank you for those who give to keep the ministries happening in this church, in this community, in the world around us. So as people who have experienced your grace and love and presence, we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'll sing our closing song, Lift Up Your Heads, Ye Mighty Gates, hymn number 213, verses 1 and 3. In these times, we need to experience God's presence all the more as we feel the weight of isolation and loneliness set in. And so for many in Christmas, as we're not able to gather in person and Christmas family dinners are going to look very different. We need to be reminded that we aren't alone. This is that picture that was made for me by Lisa, the picture that she handmade to remind me of Christ's presence in my life and the impact that Christ had on hers. May you experience God's grace and the presence of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit in your life this Advent season, that the Spirit would fill you with joy, remove that sense of isolation and loneliness and replace it with God's presence, hope, and grace. I pray that you go knowing the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and may the fellowship and presence of the Holy Spirit go with you and give you peace. Go and serve the Lord. Amen.